talk about. Hub. She's quite poor. Hello, my name is Ian. This channel is all about music and art, and this is where we talk about music and art. And in this series of videos, we've been looking at what's been happening regarding music streaming in the UK. The UK government's Digital Culture, Media and Sports Committee have been looking into the ways that the streaming platforms and other large record companies manage payments to songwriters, musicians and performers. And on the 15th of October 2020, UK Parliament published a news article stating that the Digital Culture, Media and Sports Committee were going to inquire into the impact of the streaming on the future of the music industry. The article stated that the inquiry would consider whether the government should take action to protect the industry from piracy in the wake of steps taken by the EU on copyright and intellectual property rights. Now I knew that uh, there were some high profile musicians and music industry types who were giving evidence to the committee. And the first of these meetings was on the 24th of November 2020 with another meeting on the 8th of December. Uh, and now these were long meetings lasting over three hours. So what I've done is I've decided to edit them down into shorter videos and the links to all the previous uh, meeting videos are in the description down below. It's worth giving a background to the witnesses giving evidence in this second session of January the 19th, 2021. First, we have Tony Harlow, Chief Executive of Warner Music UK. Harlow has just taken over as Chief Executive uh, as of this month, February 2021. And he joined WMG in 2010 as Managing Director of Astralasia, where he, he grew a reputation for breaking talent early, such as artists such as Ed Sheeran and Dua Lipa. Most recently, he's been pres president of WEA, the Global Artist and Label Services arm of WMG. What a lot of acronyms. Where he helped transform operations uh, and expand streaming focused markets, as well as the oversee addition of to direct to consumer expertise from Songkick, EMP, and UPROXX. Don't quite know what that is but he's well placed to look at this sort of stuff. Next, we have Jason Eiley, Chairman and Chief Executive of Sony Music UK in Ireland. Eiley is an MBE, former president of Rock Nation Records and the UK Chief of Mercury Records. He heads up all of Sony Music's activity in the UK and Ireland, overseeing Sony Music's frontline and imprint labels across the whole region, including the operations of Columbia Records, Epic, RCA, Serco, Commercial Group, Relentless, Insanity, Since 1903, Dream Life Records and Black Butter. It's a lot of record labels, isn't it? And lastly, we have David Joseph, who is the Chairman and Chief Executive of Universal Music Group and Ireland. Joseph uh, joined the company in August 1998 as General Manager of the company's Polydor label before moving up in February 2002 to become Managing Director and later Co-President of Polydor. In March 2008, he was promoted to Chairman of CEO of Universal Music UK, and since then he oversees the their labels Island, Polydor, Capital, Decca and EMI, as well as the world-famous recording studio, Abbey Road. All of the sessions for these committees were chaired by Julian Knight, and the complete list of committee members and the relevant links are in the description down below. This recording is made in agreement with the UK Parliament Terms and Conditions, which states, I cannot alter the, vi the video and audio of the recording in any way. I can't use this material for satire or use it on a website or social media platform that promotes, encourages or facilitates illegal activity or encourages hatred and antisocial behaviour. So here is part one of session two from the 19th of January 2021 into the economics of music streaming. Order, order, there's Digital Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee, <coughs> and this is our second <coughs> panel, which is into, in, uh, into economics and music streaming. Uh, could I ask, please, that if, if you're not um, answering questions, if you could mute, if that's OK. Thank you. Our second panel consists of Tony Harlow, Chief Executive Warner Music UK, Jason Lilly, Chairman and Chief Executive Sony Music UK and Ireland, Daisy, David Joseph, Chairman and Chief Executive Universal Music UK and Ireland. 
Tony, Jason and David, thank you very much for joining us today. It's much appreciated. Thank you, Chairman. Well, thank you. Uh, our first question is going to come from Clive Efford. Clive? Thank you, Chair, um, and, and welcome. Uh, in, our, in our last panel, we discussed how publishers license collectively through PRS for music. Why is there no collective licensing for recordings? Any one of you can... Who would like to answer that one? Do you, do you want to... Do you want to go first, uh, Tony? Sure, um, Mr Chairman. Um, thank you. And uh, let me just talk to the question for a second. I think it's uh, what we what we uh, use in music is the direct licence, um, and we use that for primary rights, and uh, we pay the collective licence for auxiliary or secondary rights, uh, and that operates really well. And the two collecting societies you've been talking to this morning uh, are principally in, in secondary or ancillary rights. And would anyone else like to answer that? So I'm, 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 um, I'm happy to. Um, the it, we have a direct relationship between our artists in terms of our teams and our investment and our relationship with artists, and then also the platform. So, it, um, but in broadcast, that goes through something like PPL, but not in terms of the. Um, direct relationship we we have um and uh, but my question is why is that i'm not i'm not asking you to describe what what actually happens i'm saying why is there no collective license in in recording so clive to just pick that up again um i think okay. the answer to that is we believe that that direct relationship that mr joseph just referred to gives the maximum power of negotiation and uh, it is underpinned by the ability ultimately to say no uh, to any license, and that is the maximum strength to get the best position. And wherever that position is weakened, for example, by the safe harbour that was very much the theme of the conversation before, we get less good and less effective deals. And I think that's why we favour the direct negotiation. Well, can I, can I ask you about licensing social media companies like YouTube and, and, and Twitch? I mean, how do you go about doing that? Well, how are they licensed? Any one of you can answer. Uh, do you want to go, go with that, Jason? Um, we, we have relationships with all of our streaming services, and we try to do the best, as Mr. Harlow just explained, we try to do the very best <laughs> in our negotiation with those services. And our view is that we have the ability to walk away from the table if we need to. So that's why we prefer to negotiate our rights with the respective streaming services, because whereas with, with the PPL or that conversation, there isn't essentially the ability for them to walk away from the conversation. Our, we have walked away from the conversation. Our interests are to protect our artists and to get the best deal for our artists. So that's why we believe that we should be in control of those 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 conversations. Uh, uh, we've we've seen evidence that uh, uh, YouTube uh, has, uh, has said that it's likely to be the number one source of revenue for the industry by twenty twenty five. Is that is that a healthy state for the industry to be in? Is that and and is it in the interests of the artists? Any one of you could answer. Sorry, it's a bit difficult to work out who's going to step in, Mr. Um, <laughs> what, I, what, I, what we would say about it is... Last one to step backwards, it sounds like to me. But, uh... <laughs> um, not at all. I think um, what we would say is YouTube is the source uh, for more people than all the other streaming platforms put together. And as such, it's the way people, a lot of people like to consume <clears> music. Uh, and it's a way a lot of our artists like to share music. What we would say is... It would be healthier if YouTube was not in a, not able to use uh, YouTube and other platforms like that, and you listed a couple yourself, uh, were not as able to use safe harbour provisions uh, to, to where they can say that UGC content um, is not subject to, to uh, is protected on their services. And I think um, what you'd look at is what we would always argue for is the maximum possible pool to, to share with. And what we've seen over the streaming era is the pool 
of revenue and the pool of income going back to artists growing so that we're paying more royalties now than we were before uh, in 2015. It's raised from 27 to 32 percent if you're talking Warner. And if the pool grew on the basis of less ability to hide behind safe harbour, that was probably the most effective thing we could ask for to improve the artist's position. Okay, well, let me just move, move on to Spotify. Uh, Mr. Joseph, in 2017, Universal negotiated a new multi-year global license agreement with Spotify, where you allowed Spotify to reduce royalty rates if it met certain revenue targets. So has Spotify met those targets uh, and have the reduction in rates been passed on to artists? Mr. Joseph? Um, sorry, in terms of, um, in terms of any, because this is, I, I should say, this is an incredibly competitive um, environment. And I mean, so competitive, um, there are so many more choices and so many more labels for people. I mean, the, uh, I noticed this when we were trying to open questions before, I, I should explain that, um, I haven't seen Tony Harlow for about 10 years, so Tony, hi, or I've probably spoken to Jason for a few years. So we are incredibly competitive companies, so I think you'll understand why. But I'm between you, you have 60 to 70% of the market. So, so I can only speak on behalf of Universal Music, but I can't obviously details of our deal for our music and our artists with Spotify is something I can't discuss private publicly on this call i'm very happy well okay but but i'm not asking you to give me details of the deal i'm, I'm asking you uh, you, you you came to this agreement with spotify that the, they could reduce the royalty rates um but i mean did that result in a reduction in rates being passed on to the artists that's the question it's a yes or no isn't it uh, um no i have to take a step back because th these are global deals um, that there are many, many of these deals because we're embracing as many music services as possible. You're talking about one, there are about 250, 300 agreements we have in place with different music services <coughs> around the world. And, and they cover every corner of the globe. They're all different types of services as we've learned so far on the inquiry. <laughs> And, and, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry to cut across you because we are short of time, but but the question is, uh, did it result in a reduction in rates being passed on to the artists? I mean, that, that's a straightforward question. I'm not asking you to divulge details of the uh, of the but, deal. Well, then I'll take that there is no scenario where we are successful and our artists are not successful. No, that's not, excuse because, me, excuse me, this is Joe, this is Joseph. I really do have to cut across his chair. I, I'm I'm really sorry. Mr. Effort's asked you this question three times now. Well, we could be here, frankly, I've got all day, so we could sit here all day. It's, it's, it's a fairly straightforward question. Could you please answer the question? We, I'm happy to share any information about our deal with Spotify after this, after this session today. Um, but for competitive reasons, Mr. Chair, it is understand no, no, I, I, i'm really sorry I'm so no, that, doesn't, that, that, that it, doesn't make it, sense it doesn't make sense at all i'm really sorry so, sorry excuse me cut clive uh, look the, the question is very simple it's a reduction it's just it is a reduction it is not the precise figures you're in front of a parliamentary select committee now now we've had uh, you know frankly in the past with uh, the likes of google facebook and youtube but we've had them in front of us on twitter and we found them to be frankly uh, dissembling and, and, and not being in any way clarity. So far, I have to say, you're beating them to the prize in terms of lack of clarity and lack of actual openness to a parliamentary committee. So, so Mr. Mr. Effort's going to put his question to you once more, and I do expect an answer. Mr. Effort. OK, so, so uh, the question is, has Spotify met the revenue targets, so you agreed with them, and has any reduction in rates been passed on to artists? Um, your referring to probably a new deal that we negotiated in 2017 uh there's been subsequent deals since then with uh, spotify well you but you, you you negotiated a new new multi-year global license agreement with spotify in 2017 
where you agreed with them to reduce royalty rates if they met certain targets. So did they meet those targets and did that result in a reduction in rates being passed on to the artists? That's the we, straightforward we question. Have, we have increased our, well, because of streaming and digital, we've increased the amount that our artists get. Right. So no artist has, uh, has, has suffered a reduction in rates as a consequence of that deal. We've That's the we, we've increased the amount we pay to artists, but it is important, and I hope we get a chance. And, and, and Chair, I, I really am uh, an open person. I've been watching all these inquiries. This is a business that is so close to my heart and soul. But please, I, and, and, and so much has been done about this, what, what, what is a stream? How do our artists get paid? I, re I really, really hope we can come on to that rather than spoke, focus on one uh, okay. One. Well, so, is it, is you, so, Mr. Joseph, you don't get to choose the questions. I'm, I'm not. I, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, 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 you know, okay. I'm well, not. why don't we just, we, 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 we clearly not get anywhere with this particular so, so, thing for so, the moment. I, I do, well, what we will let, do, let so, me move so, on. Order, order. What we will do is we will put this in, in writing and we will request that you put this in writing to us and you do it in a prompt fashion and that you're clear, even if the information is to be held privately. We want to get full disclosure from you on this. Is that okay, Mr. Joseph? Absolutely. Fine. Okay. Thank Clive, you. sorry. So, so I, ju I just wanted to add, it, it was similar in terms negotiated with other streaming services. <clears throat> Mr. Joseph, were, were, have you negotiated similar deals with uh, other streaming services? You mentioned that you have several. We've, we've, we've negotiated very different, because all the services, different deals with about... 250 and 300 services the 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 primary purpose of that is to get our artists music available all throughout the world this incredible music and we're the biggest investor to to our artists and we want to pay them as much through as possible we have systems mr effort where all of our artists can see exactly what they're earning from streaming and other sorts of revenue on their phone or on their browser. All of our managers look at how much they're earning. So there's no opaqueness people can understand, but please, and I hope you understand, in terms of like 250, 300 global deals, A, I don't have all the information to hand on all of those, but Mr. Chair, I will provide you as you, uh, as you request. That would that, be really helpful. But your press release um, at the time said that the unprecedented access to data creating the foundation for new tools for artists and labels to expand, engage and build deeper connections with their fans. What data did you receive from Spotify and how exactly is it being used? Um, so if I may, uh, for a second, focus on two resources we have for artist managers and... Um, well, I'd like you to focus on the data specifically. I, I, I'm just about, I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm, I'm literally just about to. Um, okay. So there's two um, portals. One's called We Have, I can't speak on behalf of others in the industry, it's called Universal Music Artists. It's a data portal where managers can look up all the trends behind the streaming data for their artists and that's by song, by platform, by country and audience. And it's incredible for tracking where an artist is growing their fan base, as well as how our marketing's working. Um, I'm very, very happy um, for another time to, to show you, everyone on the committee, these incredible portals. The data is about 24 hours kind of lag. I even checked in on a couple of our artists earlier to see how they were doing in, in different regions. All of this data can be broken down. I mean, it's literally something I have on my, on my phone. And you can literally look at a, an artist. You can look at their fan base. You can look at what age of person is listening to their stream, where they are, how many times they listen, what songs they listen to, what albums they listen to. I mean, it's fascinating. I mean, I mean, there was one I saw, we've got a brand new artist and I saw that a huge proportion of their streams was coming from North America and Brazil. And, and I should explain, this then goes, and something I'd also love to show you, to the Global Royalty Portal. 
And there an artist can see a detailed financial summary. They can see their exact royalty earnings from streaming, from different formats. And they can see it by track, platform, territory, personal advances, recording costs. I launched these at one of our managers meetings, something we usually do annually, to a small... So, Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones, I'm really sorry, but I, I don't wish to know about your annual management meeting, if that's OK. I mean, this is a little bit like dilation, I think, in terms of the, the answer to the question. Clive, are you satisfied with the answers you've received? There are a couple more questions. Please. So if you want to move on, um, uh, but I'm happy to move on to my next question. Please do. So, so this is about um, you know, the, the fact that you dominate the the, the, uh, the catalogs. Do you, do you, do uh, and this is a, again a question to all three of you. So please, one of you step forward. Do you, do your licensing agreements with or equity equity stakes in streaming services involve any deals regarding playlisting or algorithmic curation for your catalogs? Ah, uh, 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 okay. And you go first, Jason. Okay. Um, we try our best for all of our artists to make sure that um, whether it's catalog artists or current artists are streamed as much as possible. So if I look, for example, at George Michael three years ago, as a cat, obviously as a catalog artist, his 70% of his music was sold physically. And now 85% of his repertoire is now streamed. So it's equally in our interest to make sure that we look after our catalogue artists as well as our modern artists. Would anyone else like to, to add anything to that? Well, Clive, I'd just like to say probably that uh, I think your question was also pointing at whether our deals in, uh, gave any advantage to different kinds of artists and whether we got preferential terms in, play, in terms of things like placement. And the yes. answer is no, we don't. Those are the conversations we have about the importance of acts. I think earlier today, the uh, PPL uh, gentleman, Peters, uh, referred to say something like how uh, Universal created such a brilliant story around Queen. Um, and it's about storytelling for us. And that is actually the nature of our business in a large way. It's about um, thriving, uh, taking artists and their creativity and telling stories about it. We don't build it into deals. All right. Because, I mean, I mean, you do have a very dominant position in the market, don't you? Do you really consider it's healthy for a market that is already close to being an oligopoly to own equity in, in Spotify or major streaming services, uh, which is a major streaming service for your product, or for Tencent, another Sp Spotify equity holder, to own shares or have shares owned by your parent companies? I mean, it, it, it is an unhealthy relationship in the, for the industry, is it not? Well, to be very clear, we don't own any shares in Spotify at this point, although you're right to talk, talk about uh, Tencent's stake in us and also we have a small stake in Deezer, which is a significant platform in other countries. Um, but I don't think that, that that's um, more about our efforts to uh, encourage the pool to grow by licensing as many different parties as we can. Now, on occasion, when we're, when we're licensing startups and interested platforms, we will take a, a small stake to cover the risk that we're taking on behalf of ourselves and our artists, remembering all, at all times we're aligned with our artist interests. So what we're attempting to do is grow as many platforms as possible, as widely as possible. <clears throat> On occasion, that is a solution. I don't think there is any implication at all of, of market power. And I think when you talk about market power, you should always consider barriers to entry. And I think, again, Peter earlier and, and both my, my colleagues here have talked about the fact that there are very limited barriers to entry in music these days. Um, DIY is the most is the simplest way to consider that. When Mr. Eck at Spotify talks about 40 or 50,000 tracks going to 50 million and being in their catalogue, you can see we provide a very, very small amount of that music. Thank you. I'm happy. Uh, yeah. Uh, do you want to, uh, as well, Jason and then David, very briefly? Okay. So... Two, 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 two points there. The first point in respect of competition, and Mr. Joseph mentioned this earlier on, there is more competition in the music industry now than in 30 years of doing this job. The independent sector is a brilliant sector and signs some of the best acts. There's more, more opportunity for artists to either sign to a major label, sign to an independent label, 
or distribute their own records. There are more avenues today than ever that I've ever seen in my time of doing this job. So that's just the point to number one. The second point in, regard, in relation to Spotify, yes, Sony does still have a small holding in, in Spotify. When you know, Spotify launched over 15, 16 years ago, and when we do deals, we often take a small share of a company. None of us in 2006 had any idea that Spotify would be as big as it is today. None of us. I remember sitting in a boardroom and we were discussing the whole concept of streaming and a majority of that boardroom, in fact, 99%, the one person, the head of digital said in that, in that boardroom, the streaming was the future. And all of us as executives at that time just didn't believe it would happen. We all totally believed in ownership, never believed that people would not want to open a CD, look at the booklet, read the track listing, read the, the liner notes. We didn't believe it was going to happen. It has. And that is great for the industry. And it is great for artists. And going back to the point on, uh, on our shareholding, Yes, we, have, we still have a, hold, a, sh a shareholding. We divested um, half of our shareholding a couple of years ago, and we put, we, we put 200, over $250 million of that shareholding directly into the pockets of our artists. Thank you. David, you wanted to come in. David Joseph. Um, thank you. And not to take up too much time, I just wanted to echo the um, comments. Um, in, in my 30 years plus of working in the industry, I have never seen a more competitive environment between labels, do-it-yourself, options, de deal terms, honestly, and, and platforms. It is the most competitive environment with so many choices. That's all I wanted to add, Jeff. Right. Thank you. Um Jason, just to follow up on that, uh, you just mentioned there about the fact that you were in this room and no one actually believed Spotify would be as big as it was or music stream would be as big as it was. Do you recognise that the economics of the industry has not caught up with that yet? I think that 80% the, the of our revenue comes from streaming and we spend more money on A&R and marketing, again, than I have ever seen in my, in my career. So if I look at the last few years since I've been running Sony Music, we spent over 190 million in A&R. I, I have increased the label structure. When I started at Sony Music, there were six labels within the company. Now there's 15. So it's been a huge investment in more labels in order to help us sign more acts. Over that same period, I spent over 175 million pounds on marketing those acts. We have 400, over 400 employees within our company that help sign artists, market acts, do the press, promotion, digital campaigns. We have an, a huge investment. So, and I go back to the point that if, if an artist does not want to sign to Sony, they have a choice. And if they wish to earn more of that revenue, they can sign and sign to a distribution company. If you look at today, three of the most culturally important acts in Georgia Smith or AJ Tracy or Skepta have chosen to sign to a distribution company. They want a bigger share of the, 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 the revenue and that's their choice. And you know, respect to them and their management, that's their decision. I clearly would not prefer them to sign to Sony Music, but that's the opportunity of choice. Um. In terms of the contracts, though, you just sort of there about exactly how you've been able to diversify your own business and be able to sign more acts as a result and bring on more talent. But in terms of contracts, are they actually caught up with the world of music stream? Because obviously, one of the things been mentioned to us has been about breakages and the fact that yeah, artists often have that in their contracts. Uh, that seems to be bizarre and quite usury, actually, in a, in a, in a digital age. Okay. So the latter point, in breakages is categorically not true. I've heard the session where it was alleged that mm. we charge breakages on, on, on physical distribution and digital distribution. From Sony Music's perspective, that is not true. That does not happen. 
So do the, the other uh, two witnesses as well. Sorry, just to check that. Tony and David, do you charge uh, breakages uh, 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 on your artists? Uh, 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 in terms of digital royalties, they are 100% clean. They, 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 uh, I, I did hear that in the inquiry, and it, it's no... It's not an industry that I recognise or a company okay. practice that I would Th have. Thank you, David. Tony, yes or no? I 100% agree with uh, Jason and David. I would point out, Mr Chair, so, that there is a different uh, definition of breakage in digital. So breakage in the old physical world related to shipping shellac records that might break. Breakage in the digital world is the... Uh, is where a minimum guarantee isn't reached by the number of streams we work, we get, deliver, and that works in the artist's favour. So there's a different definition of breakage in the digital world, and we need to be clear that we're talking about the same thing. But in terms of the old breakage, no, we don't. We're not involved in that at all. David, you just put your hand up again. David, David Joseph. Just to um, just to echo those thoughts because I think it's 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 really important on the on the term breakage. So. The DSP sometimes, there's a thing called digital breakage, uh, Mr. Chair. The DSP sometimes guarantee labels a minimum amount of revenue for plays of their catalogue over a certain period, which is effectively minimum guarantees. If the actual revenues paid to the label fall short of the minimum guarantees, then the DSP pays the label the balance, which is called digital breakage. Universe. So, so it's almost like a royalty. It's a royalty. No, no, it's just the difference between the two. But it's very important to say that Universal accounts a share of all of this breakage to artists according to the number of plays of their tracks across the minimum guarantee period in the same way as other revenue received from the platforms. I just wanted to. So, so, so we share. So, do you, do you take this money up front? Or do you take it? Do you do you claw it back if you find that there's a shortfall? Oh, uh, oh, it, it, it can it can absolutely vary because because but we share all. So in some it. cases you do take it up front. Sometimes we take things up front, and sometimes okay. negotiate. So therefore, that is effectively it's it, you are you are putting something called breakage, which basically means that there's a shortfall in the the the, the money that you get in for the stream when actually what you 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 think you should be getting in. And that basically is set out in the contract, and that is so almost in some respects, it's not quite a breakage, but it's a type of 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 of, of royalty, if you like, a sort of type of royalty clawback, if necessary. If necessary, I'm not sure. In, I understand. in that way, I, I, I was so sorry, sorry uh, Tony. Well, I'll give you an example. If you write a book, for instance, I mean, I know this in terms of books. So you write a book, and it doesn't sell. I've, I've done a few of those, I can tell you. And um, what happens is you're paid a royalty, and if you don't earn out that royalty, then you have to pay that money back. That's that's in, so no. in the same way. No, no, I don't think so. so. No, I think what we're saying is it, we do a guarantee. Uh, we negotiate each of these deals separately, as Mr. Joseph has said. If we were, if in a deal with a platform, they guaranteed us, they would guarantee us a minimum guarantee of ten pounds. If the number of streams we our artists actually delivered added up to seven pounds they would still owe us the three pounds. Mr. Joseph is saying that that three pounds, and Warner Music was pleased to be the first company that, that instigated this procedure, that three pounds is then allocated back to the artists on the basis of their performance on the platform. So when we talk about digital breakage, it works in the favour of the artists. When we talk about physical breakage, that's a deduction. And we should be very clear what we're talking about in this language. None of us charge physical breakage anymore based on what my part, counterparts have said. And I know what Warner is, but but all of us uh, are beneficiaries at certain times of of having done a smarter deal than the platform realised. Okay, thank you. Take care. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers now. Bye bye.